Hello everyone, a very very good evening to one and all. Welcome to Study IQ IAS English. I'm Abhishek Singh and uh, today I'm here in front of you with our new topic taken from the India's Ancient Past by R.S. Sharma. And in this series of uh, Ancient Histories lecture, today is the 27th lecture in which we are going to talk about the Sangam age and Sangam literature. So guys, this is a very, very crucial session because uh, this topic has been the constant favorite of the UPSC, particularly if we are concerned about the ancient history portion. Not just that, even the questions have been asked in the past from the Sangam literature part. So make it sure that you attend this session and you also share this video, share this class link with your friends as well so that they can also join us. So let us start without any further delay and uh, make it sure that if you have joined the session, do not forget to share it with your friends as well. And uh, if we are talking about uh, preparation and the questions, then we must not forget that this is probably the best opportunity for all of us to start our preparations at this moment where the new batches in the morning slot are going to start from the 11th of August and these batches are offered in uh, English, English and Hindi, all three medium. Not just that, if you are completely a fresher or even if you have some idea about the content as well as the syllabus of the exam, still this is going to be equally great and useful for all of you because it will be comprehensively covering each and every aspect of the civil services examination like uh, you know the handwritten notes will be provided to you comprehensive gs and uh, prelims particularly and mains as well both will be covered apart from that the current affairs part and everything else not only that you will get the dedicated books as well as if you clear the prelims examination you will also be called here at the study iq campus for the mains residential program so all these are quite uh, great features you must uh, check those features by visiting our application or uh, the link which is uh, going to be given in the comment box. Now moving to the topic straight, okay, moving directly to the topic here. The topic is basically Sangam age, all right, Sangam age. Guys, recently if you are aware, right, if you are a conscious student and aware about the historical discoveries or historical inventions, then you must have heard about a place called as, a, right, sorry, <coughs> a place that is called as Kiradi, called as Kiradi. Okay, so that place called as Kiradi, Kiradi is that place where we have uh, discovered a new evidence of the Sangam age civilization, and that particularly is also called as the Vaigai, Vaigai civilization. Okay, Vaigai civilization. This place is a very, very important place as far as the research and the understanding of the Sangam age sites in our history is concerned. Why so? Because the answer is here. Can you see this time period 300 BCE to 600 CE? From where did I get this time period? This time period or this time duration assigned to the Sangam age that is basically as per the right as per the convenience of the historians who were having the earlier idea including r s sharma including k a nilkant shastri or some other famous historians who are dealing in the ancient history of india however if we go by the latest excavations and the discovery of this historical monument or this historical place, then we can have the idea that probably the Sangam age, it was having a similar time period, a similar time period which is comparable to the proper Iron Age cultures of the other parts of our subcontinent. Okay, everyone. So, this is another aspect of the same chapter which you have to listen and think about. But 
since we are covering rs sharma and tamil nadu board as well as the ncrt basic so here as per the information given in those books we have to categorize the time period in the southern india as following so here we have the evidences of evidences of uh, the neolithic period neolithic period as old as approximately 1000 bc okay however around 1000 bc if we are seeing the neolithic period we start getting such structures having the large stone slabs kept over the you know kept over the stone pallets having this type of you know gappings in between and several smaller pieces of stones are scattered in the nearby era areas these places you know these places they indicate they indicate the burial sites they indicate the burial sites and if we are talking about the burial sites definitely this indicates the settlement of the population in that area because if the population will be there only then the people will die and they will be buried but the question that comes into our mind when we see such type of a structure that why was this special structure erected over the burial sites of the people then we come to a conclusion as per the literary description given in the literature that we have obtained from the sangam period about which we will study in the subsequent part of this lecture then we try to come to a conclusion that probably such burials indicated the reputed warriors or some sort of uh, reputed individuals in the contemporary society isn't it like today we can see that in the medieval period those people who belonged to the royal houses or royal households they had the huge monuments isn't it the monuments like the great mausoleums of uh, mughal emperors you can see that similarly even today also in the modern history as well we have the great you know burial monuments of the personalities of modern era so it is quite possible that these type of special burial sites might be related to the related to the burial sites of some great warriors or great poets or any other great personalities in case if this belonged to the warriors right these stones were called as the <coughs> called as the natukal or virakkal natukal or virakkal right virakkal or natukal remember the point that this enormous stone structure which means mega mega means large and stone means lithic right here so large stone slabs kept upon the such burial places due to which we got the name called as the megalithic culture called the megalithic culture and remember the point here i remember the point here that if we are talking about the megalithic culture we must understand one point that in this phase of the cultural growth there was the total absence total absence of any type of civilizational symptoms present in the contemporary area all right everyone so what can we conclude we can conclude that probably the megalithic period the megalithic period that was that was followed by followed by the initial developments okay megalithic period was followed by initial developments or the early developments early developments of the small and rural settlements and rural settlements which might have eventually come into the might have eventually come into the contact with they came into 
into contact with the mid gangetic cultures okay mid gangetic cultures and afterwards there would have been the development of the development of the urban settlements of the urban settlements and kingdoms and kingdoms all right everyone so at least rs sharma and other typical ancient history books that we are going to study for our civil services examination they think that or they provide us the information that the development of the civilization in the southern part right in the southern part of the country if you have not seen it on the map here let me tell you that this is the part about which we are talking here right this is the southern tip of our country and you can see here it is it is beyond the nilgiris where we come across the regions which are surrounded by the sea from all the three sides and here you can see the presence of the chera kingdom the pandya kingdom and the cholas kingdom all right however these kingdoms will be emerging later on because in the early stages there will not be the kingdoms because do not forget the you know conventional method of the civilizational development that we had studied way back in the harappan civilization that before the development of any proper kingdom we have to go through the phases like the rural settlement the growth of the market and other type of economic activities followed by the growth of the cities and the states that means these states might not be present in the earlier part of the development of this area from megalithic to the rural culture all right everyone so here we can say that from megalithic period we got to see the development of small rural settlements after that we got to see the contact with the mid gangetic valley remember guys the mid gangetic culture means the area in which we consider the eastern up and the western bihar in the today's time and we all are aware that that particular area it was undergoing the great extent of civilizational development because of the agrarian progress and <clears throat> the agrarian progress as well as the discovery of iron both had led to the growth of the trade and commerce in the mid gangetic valley from where the traders might have traveled to the southern india and probably they might have contacted with the local farmers and producers in the southern india right this is the this is the exact hypothesis that most of the historians including rs sharma present in their books not just that not just that they, this is the process this is the process of cultural exchange the process of cultural exchange exchange occurs in a specific right occurs in a specific area a specific region which is called as right which is called as tamilgam called as tamilgam okay tamilgam remember that all right everyone so we have the informations we have the informations like that from where we can conclude the development of the development of the sangam age that was a process which took quite a long period of time all right everyone what is the name of the path through which we reach to the sangam age locations those path that that particular path is called as the dakshina path dakshina path all right everyone here if i am talking about the other sources from where we get to know something about the sangam age culture or sangam age civilization so here the other sources which tell us about the states present in this area these sources include 
the Ashokan edicts, particularly the second and the thirteenth edict. They tell us about the various states or the various kingdoms which were located in the southern part of Indian peninsula and they were known by the different names including the Cheras, Cholas, Pandyas and you know, Satyaputras. Cheras were called as the Keralputras. So, all these informations we have, all these informations we already have it. But the question arises in our mind that if we have this information, then were there any other sources apart from the Mauryan edicts which could tell us about the growth and development of the culture and civilization in the southern India? All right, everyone. So, here we have the original sources called as the Sangam literature which was written in the Tamil language and this makes the Tamil language as one of the most ancient and continuously used linguistic right, linguistic features in our country. All right, everyone. So, what is the meaning of Sangam? First of all, this is very important to understand. So, if we talk about the term called Sangam, the term called Sangam, Sangam is basically inspired, that is influenced from a Sanskrit term. The Sanskrit term for this Sangam is called as a Sangh, called as a Sangh. Sangh means what? Sangh means association. Sangh means association or assembly or assembly. Okay. So, when we are talking about Sangam, this indicates the association or assembly of the great scholars. Okay. So, that means association or assembly of great scholars or assembly of great scholars. All right, everyone. So, here let me tell you one thing that if association or assembly of the great scholars that is taking place, this must have been supported by any capable, any capable dynasty which could house the you know thousands and in, in fact not thousands then if at least hundreds of the scholars belonging to the different regions, different uh, groups, isn't it? So, definitely we have the informations about uh, where did this Sangam happen, when did it happen and is there any evidence which, de which describes about the events and the literary compilations which took place there. So, definitely this table is uh, going to tell you about the place. So, the first Sangam that took place at uh, Tenmadurai, okay. Second, that took place at uh, Kapatpuram and third, that took place at Madurai. Practically, these three places are located in the surroundings of uh, the city called as Madurai. The city called as Madurai. Okay. This automatically makes Madurai as one of the oldest inhabited cities in our country. Not only that, if we go through the name of the chairman, which means the scholar who was most important and who chaired this association or this assembly, in the first two, we have the name of Agathyar. Agathyar is a, a none, all right, he is nothing, uh, nobody but he is Agastya, the same, the same sage who is called Agastya in the North Indian tradition is known as the Agathyar at Agathyar in the, in the Tamil tradition, all right. In the second one, we have another person along with Agathyar whose name was Tolkapir whose name was Tolkapir. Tolkapir is regarded as the ancient most laureate who compiled this book called as Tolkapiam, called as Tolkapiam. All right. Apart from that, if we are talking about the third Sangam that took place where? That took place at the proper Madurai. And who was the chairman of that? The chairman was Mudai Tiruman, right? Right, Mudathirumaran Nakirar. So, Mudathirumaran Nakirar was the 
चेयरपर्सन ऑफ द थर्ड संगम एंड गाइज द एंटायर संगम लिटरेचर दैट वी हैव राइट नाउ दैट बिलोंग्स टू दिस थर्ड संगम कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑल राइट एवरी वन नाउ वेन आई हैव टोल्ड यू अबाउट दिस और दीज प्लेसिस वेन आई जस्ट टोल्ड यू दैट दिस ग्रेट असेंबली मस्ट हैव द पैटर्नेज ऑफ एनी पर्टिकुलर किंगडम और एनी पर्टिकुलर डायनेस्टी ऑफ द रूलर्स देन इट बिकम्स वेरी नेचुरल टू हैव दिस हैव दिस क्वेश्चन दैट हु माइट बी दोज रूलर्स हु माइट बी दोज रूलर्स और विच माइट बी दैट डायनेस्टी राइट सो इफ वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट द रूलर्स एंड द डायनेस्टीज गाइज द संगम लिटरेचर वॉज कंपाइल्ड द संगम लिटरेचर वॉज कंपाइल्ड एट द मदुरई एट एट द मदुरई दैट वॉज द कैपिटल ऑफ कैपिटल ऑफ द पांड्या किंगडम द पांड्या किंगडम all right and what right where was this pandya kingdom located so if you know this uh, southern part of the country right here we can say that in the south eastern coastal area we had the presence of the cholas okay then in the south western part of the southern india we had the presence of the cheras and in the central region in the central region we had the presence of uh, pandyas okay pandyas and even this year also upsc had asked a question about the important cities located in these kingdoms whether uh, no they were the port cities or were they the capital cities such type of question was asked this year in upsc's civil services preliminary examination and remember that the cities like puhar puhar or kaveri patnam okay puhar or kaveri patnam all right this used to be the capital of the cholas then there was a <coughs> madurai madurai was the capital of the right madurai was the capital of the pandyas and then there was a mujiris right mujiris right mujiris and that used to be the right, capital of the cheras okay mujiris or that used to be the capital of cheras remember that korkai korkai was another place right korkai was another place that used to be the capital city and later on it was replaced later on it was replaced so such type of questions are expected to come in the examination all right until and unless such questions appear on the question paper we are never expecting such type of questions in our examination but when it comes we are all taken by surprise that uh, from where has they asked this question but if you observe it carefully since last 5 years either one or two questions must have been there in the civil services preliminary examination from direct indirectly connected to this particular topic sangam age or literature or kingdom anything like that all right everyone so it is very very crucial to understand this entire time period in very much detail now coming to the literature part coming to the sangam literature part so sangam literature is basically the compilation of uh, all the debates discussions discourses which took place during the assembly of this huge assembly of the you know various scholars belonging to the tamil language or the other distinctive regional features of their respective times but overall overall we can have the entire sangam literature corpus divided into divided into two major portions or two major types the first type is called as the narrative text narrative text means what the text which is basically in the form of a fiction in the form of the story or the narration okay 
and the second part is called as the didactive text didactive text means what the text which is in the form of the lecture preachings or sermons okay so when we talk about the narrative text this consists of the right this consists of a total of 18 works total of 18 works remember that the narrative texts are called as melkan kakku right called as the melkan kakku all right everyone the melkan kakku is basically the compilation of 18 works in the narrative style and those 18 works in the narrative style they are divided into the anthologies and idols which means the appraisal works and the small poetries these anthologies they are called as a atutogai and the idols are called as pattu pattu all right everyone and if we are talking about these 18 narrative texts that means the story like or uh, you know narration of some incident or event then there must be some sort of theme of the narration some theme of the narration so the theme of the narration is again categorized into two types of themes aham and puram aham means love and puram means bravery valor okay that is basically about the narrative text in the sangam literature then we come to the second type of the literature which is a deductive or didactive in the nature that is that is in the form of uh, lectures or uh, you know instructions or preacher right preachings etc isn't it that text is known as a kilkan nakko right known as kilkan nakko when we are talking about the deductive text or didactive text it is called as kilkan nakko and they are mainly concerned with the ethical literature or the moral lectures or instructions to the different people right everybody so let me just draw a simple flow chart for this particular literature here so sangam literature is divided into two types okay these two types include these two types include the melkan kakku right melkan kakku and and uh, kilkan nakku right and kilkan nakku when we categorize this melkan kakku and kilkan nakku we call melkan nakku as the 18 major work 18 major work and this is called as the 18 minor work all right and the 18 major works they are divided further into two types which are the anthologies anthologies and idols remember that the melkan nakku and kilkan nakku both are 18 in number so anthologies it becomes easier for you to remember anthologies they have the eight et to togai eight et to togai what is the meaning of the et to togai anthologies and there are total 10 idols which are called as pattu pattu called as pattu pattu okay so this is very simple very simple way of understanding the names of these literary works which we have obtained in the sangam period this all work belongs to the third sangam third sangam that occurred that actually took place near about in the third century ad right that was the time apart from these texts apart from these textbooks there are several other books in the ancient tamil literature that we can say were compiled during the sangam period and the most important among all of them that is tirukkural that is tirukkural tirukkural is basically written by right, written by tiruvalluvar and this is regarded as one of the most sacred and most important textbooks religious textbooks in the tamil literature and let me tell you that this terukural is regarded as the you know similar to the gita bhagavad gita 
as Bhagavad Gita is to Sanskrit, the same value Tirukural has for the Tamil literature. If we are talking about the oldest Tamil work in literature, then we have this Tolakapiyam, which is uh, basically nothing but the Tamil grammar written by the you know the chairperson, the co-chairperson of the second Sangam, and whose name was Tolakapiyar, whose name was Tolakapiyar. All right, everyone. So overall, if we are talking about the Sangam literature, we just don't have the Sangam works, but we also have the works which were compiled later on and those works include the Tamil epics, Tamil epics. Remember the name of the epics, at least three of them, at least three of them is really important. The top three that is a Silapadikaram, second one is a Manimekale and the third one that is a Sivaga Sintamani. Okay. So basically, Silapadikaram that is written by whom? Written by Ilango Adigal. Ilango Adigal. And who was this Ilango Adigal, by the way? Guys, Ilango Adigal and this book, Silapadikaram, that has got a very beautiful story. Ilango Adigal was basically the younger brother of uh, the Chera king, Shenaguttavan. Okay, Shenaguttavan. And the Shera king, Shenaguttavan, he had started the practice of uh, Kannagi worship. Kannagi worship means also known as the Patini Puja or Kannagi was basically the lead heroine in this particular story. Okay. So, if you remember, if you might have read that NCRT book, if you have not read, then you must understand that this is the story of uh, Kovalan, Kannagi and Madhavi. Kovalan, who was the merchant, Kannagi, his wife, and Madhavi, who was the courtson. Now, when we come across this story, we get to see that when the king of the Pandyas, right, the king of the Pandyas, whose name was Nendun Charyan, when he decided to punish Kovalan for the treachery, right, for the treachery and debauchery, actually, his wife, Kannagi pleaded before the king that his hus uh, her husband is absolutely innocent. Unfortunately, the king did not hear and he announced the capital punishment. Due to that, the extreme remorseful Kannagi, she cursed the king and the king out of the remorse committed suicide. Okay, So, this is actually how the story goes. The important part is that important part is that this story suggests that despite having the affairs outside the marriages, the wives were extremely devoted to their husbands, which indicated that probably the position of the woman that might not be considered as equally, equally better as that of a man. Right? So, that is what we come to the that is what we come to as conclusion. Now, apart from that, if we talk about the Mani Meghale or uh, Zivak Zintamani, so these are also the these are also the uh, epics which are you know respectively connected with the Buddhism and Jainism. Buddhism and Jainism. All right, everyone. So overall, we can say that that this particular society, this particular society, it was uh, having the great literary tradition, the great literary tradition and not just that, this literary tradition, it was actually pioneered as well as promoted by the great kingdoms which were located in the distinct parts of the, distinct parts of the right, far, far south India. So, which were these three great kingdoms? What were their identities if we are talking about? So, these three great kingdoms included, right? These three great kingdoms included the kingdom of the Cheras, Cholas and Pandyas. Okay? Cheras. <coughs> these Cheras, their capital was uh, located at Vanji. Okay? Located at Vanji. And their port city was uh, Mujiris and Tondai. 
चोड़ास हैड द कैपिटल एट उरयूर एंड पुहार कावेरी पटनम और पुहार दैट वॉज देयर पोर्ट सिटी पांड्यास हैड द कैपिटल एट मदुरई बट देयर अनदर ओल्ड कैपिटल वॉज ऑल्सो लोकेटेड एट कोरक विच वॉज ऑल्सो द फेमस पोर्ट सिटी एंड वेरी वेल नोन फॉर द पर्ल फिशिंग फॉर द पर्ल कैप्चर दिस इज द क्वेश्चन अबाउट विच आई एम टॉकिंग टू यू दिस क्वेश्चन वॉज डायरेक्टली आस्कड इन द ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री सिविल सर्विसेस प्रिलिम्स एग्जामिनेशन डायरेक्ट क्वेश्चन ओके डायरेक्ट क्वेश्चन एंड इट इज नॉट लाइक दैट after the question has been asked i have added it here this was already added when i had you know taught it previously so this is the direct question that we have got from this particular page now if we are talking about the emblems of the different kingdoms so cheras had bow cholas has tiger and pandyas had fish and similarly if we are talking about the some famous rulers like uh, cheras had the you know shyanaguttavan the elder brother of elango adigal cholas had karikalan the same karikalan who had occupied sri lanka and pandyas they had nendunjerian nendunjerian basically the same nendun uh, nendunjerian who had punished kovalan who had punished kovalan and was cursed by kannagi all right now talking about uh, these three that right, these three dynasties in little bit of details little bit of details so if we are talking about cheras <coughs> if we are talking about cheras remember that cheras were ruling in the areas of modern kerala and the sea ports i have already told about them tondai and mujiris and the most important part is that that there is a text there is a text called as the padirupattu right padirupattu this provides the information about a lot of chera kings a lot of chera kings including including senguttavan also got it cheras had the trading relations with the with the roman empire what is the evidence of that how are we able to say that because we have the presence of we have the presence of the roman settlements roman settlements at the vanji that was the capital of the cheras that was the capital of the cheras so whenever you have the you know presence of any foreign settlement in your capital which clearly indicates the presence of the embassy like today also in delhi we have the embassies of uh, various countries isn't it similarly the chera capital they had the embassy of the roman empire which indicated that probably they had the good trading relations with the roman empire all right now the question arises naturally that the cheras were very small very small kingdom then why did they have the trading relations and what type of trading relations with the romans they actually exported the cardamom they exported the pepper they exported the fine right fine cloths as well as the as well as the most important thing that was the tusk that was the tusk or ivory tusk or the ivory okay so ivory that is the tusk of the elephant that is the most important export from this small state of the cheras talking about the next one that is cholas cholas basically ruled in the nearby areas of the tiruchirappalli up to the southern andhra pradesh region initially their capital was located at urayur and then shifted to pohar shifted to pohar okay if we are talking about the chola rulers in the early cholas or the ancient cholas remember that the ancient cholas and the imperial cholas they are they are actually different they might have some connection or might not have the connection that is a matter of debate but if we are talking about the two ruling dynasties there is a huge gap of several centuries in fact if i become uh, particular then approximately 700 or 800 years of the gap prevails between the two dynasties the ancient cholas and the imperial cholas ancient cholas about which uh, about whom are we talking here we are talking here 
दे वर हैविंग सम फेमस रूलर्स लाइक करिकालन और एलारा ओके और एलारा नॉट ओनली दैट नॉट ओनली दैट इंपीरियल चोलास हु विल बी कमिंग इन आवर सब्जेक्ट अराउंड टेंथ सेंचुरी दे विल बी बेसिकली हैविंग सम ग्रेट रूलर्स इनफैक्ट द ग्रेटेस्ट रूलर्स दैट इंडिया हैज एवर प्रोड्यूस्ड इंक्लूडिंग द राज राजा चोला और राजेंद्र चोला राइट सो हियर करिकालन एंड एलारा दीज टू वर वेरी फेमस बोथ हैड ऑक्यूपाइड श्रीलंका बट एलारा हैड रूल्ड श्रीलंका फॉर ओवर फिफ्टी ईयर्स ओवर फिफ्टी ईयर्स एट अ ह्यूज टाइम ओके इनफैक्ट करिकालन इज ऑल्सो फेमस फॉर मेकिंग अ चेक डैम कॉल एज अ कलन अगेंस्ट द रिवर कावेरी ऑन द रिवर कावेरी so that has to be one of the oldest dams were right ever ever constructed in the history of our country talking about the pandyas the pandyas who were the most famous because they held sangam literature they held the sangam or the association of the great scholars okay their capital was madurai <coughs> their capital was madurai and these kings right these pandyan kings such as uh, right such as the nadian or uh, mudukudumi or uh, peruvaludi these kings were basically very well known why so because if you just talk about the socio economic conditions of the pandya country or the pandyan region there is a book there is a book called as a madurai kanji this book called madurai kanji that describes about not only the rulers of the pandyas but also about the socio economic conditions of the pandyan kingdom it also tells about the sea ports trades and other import exports etc in fact the pandyan rule that was actually you know that was actually one of the most prosperous dynasties in the sangam period but that started to decline due to the invasion of the kalbharas invasion of the kalbharas however remember that cheras and the pandyas they would be continuously ruling for several centuries several centuries later than the sangam period all right in fact the pandyas will be you know they will be resurging again and again and finally they will be replaced by the replaced by the madurai sultanat which would emerge there which would which would emerge there and the sultanate would emerge once the pandyas would be defeated by alauddin khilji's army that is way ahead in the medieval period so from the ancient till the medieval they would continue to become the ruler or the vassals of the rulers in that area all right everyone now the question arises that what could be the reason behind such extended longevity such extended time period of these small dynasties another question that might come to your mind that why were no right why were none of the greater dynasties coming from the northern india or from the deccan part why were they not completely annexing these areas and uh, completely removing the existence of these dynasties what made them to survive for such a long period of time the answer is only one thing their economic power their economic supremacy which they had acquired by having the profitable trade relations with the roman empire not only the roman empire but also they had the profitable trade relations with the chinese and with the arab countries and remember their proximity to the coastal area or their presence of uh, numerous sea ports famous for the trade and commercial purposes made them immensely wealthy and that wealth was that was actually utilized in the longer sustainability of these kingdoms okay in fact they produced pepper ivory pearls precious stones muslin silk cotton everything which was required by the romans in their trade these small kingdoms were almost capable of supplying whatever the romans were requiring and in exchange of that we got the 
huge amount of gold huge amount of gold right in fact let me tell you that uh, one of the great roman senators pliny the elder he writes that he writes that we must stop trading with the trading with the land of indos or simply they call it india why because that works as the sink of the gold whatever gold we have that goes into the sink of india and india is actually having you know, the collection of all of our gold got it that was the that was the great achievement of these smaller kingdoms now talking about uh, about their society so if we are concerned about the society we must understand the nature of the economy because the economy and society or the socio economic structure is basically interrelated to each other okay so when we see the economic division remember that the land in their kingdom it was categorized on the basis of on the basis of the land quality for example the hilly areas were called as the kurunji and the dt of that area was murgan where the people were simply living like uh, the early humans based upon hunting and uh, gathering of the food nothing else but as we come on the slope areas remember this okay this is the hilly area so when we talk about the hilly areas we have the kurunji okay the land is called kurunji and the dt was murgan the people were hunting and honey collecting right connect collecting the honey etc when we talk about the slopes when we talk about the slope areas that land was called mulai and the people in that area they worshiped lord mayon and uh, they were pastoral in their activities their primary activity was pastoralism grazing their animals and remember i had told you in the previous lecture that in the southern india there was a god who used to have the flute who used to attract the cows who was basically the god of cow herders something very similar in identity with the lord krishna the cow herder okay however the lord mayon in the sangam period he had the similar features as we talk about lord krishna who used to live in that you know among the family of cow herders or who used to steal you know the butter and the milk etc right some 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 type of stories that we hear about lord krishna they are also related to the lord mayon and he was basically the dt of cattle rearing and and the pastoral families then when we come to the plain areas when we come to the plain areas the plains were basically called as marudam marudam or agricultural land the chief dt was indra indra is basically nothing but indra indra was the indra was the dt of rain and the primary occupation would be obviously the agriculture because the land is land is the plain area that is the plain land then we talk about such areas which were the low lying regions the low lying coastal areas the coastal areas were called as the nidal called as the nidal and uh, the dt was varunan and the people they were occupied into the simple simple coastal occupations like fishing like uh, salt manufacturing etc or the pearl collection etc all right pearl collection etc in fact the pandian the pandian kingdom they had very famous port called korkai right that was very famous for the catching of the pearls okay then another type of land which was uh, simply the waste land the dry or the arid land arid land or the desert land that was called as the palai called as the palai and that desert or the arid land it was it was the area where the robbery was the source of livelihood and they worshiped the dt called as a koravai dt called as a koravai all right everyone so we can say that it was a very basic society where the types of the landforms 
they directly impacted the nature of the economic activities done by the group of people living over that area and this is where this is where we understand the nature of the dt as well as the cultural evolution in that in that part depending upon their economic activity all right everyone now when we talk about the sangam administration we can understand with this description here that sangam administration was definitely not like the modern administration it did not have that much extension that much you know vastness it was simply very basic and somewhat very similar to the early vedic or uh, later vedic culture for example the court was called avai and the tree the tree that was uh, planted in the name of the ruler that tree was called as the kodimaram under the shadow of that tree the subsequent ruler used to hold their courts hold their darbars and the darbars or the courts or the assemblies they used to have the five member who were called as the panch mahasabhas panch mahasabhas remember the names they were amaichar amaichar basically amatya something very similar to amatya then senapatiar senapatiar basically similar to the senapati or the commander in chief then uttarar uttarar basically the one who gives the answers uttarar spy then the tudar right tudar or dutar dut dut means that means the envoy ambassador or dut and purohitar purohitar basically priest guys do you have a question in your mind where we can have this type of doubt that why were these people why were these people having the names quite sanskritic quite sanskrit like it is because it is because under the concept of tamilgam under the concept of the tamilgam okay the development of administration the development of administration that was mainly credited credited to the cultural contacts cultural contacts with the brahmanical system brahmanical system of the mid gangetic valley or mid gangetic region okay mid gangetic regions so we can say that we can say that this is why we see the great influence of the sanskrit terminology at least on uh, the on the names of these important members of the members of the royal court all right everyone similarly if we talk about the titles here then we can say the titles sound very regional in the linguistic origin for example you will not see right you will not see the name of the titles similar to the sanskrit titles in sanskrit we had the deva putra deva naam priya we had the you know vikramaditya such type of titles but here in the tamil we have the titles like the one right the one varadamban right one varamban or one one kuttavan or itumpor irumporai or villavar such type of titles quite quite regional in the character okay if we are talking about the titles remember the titles name because these were different for the cheras different for the cholas and pandyas you can expect such type of names in the question of match the following types in your prelims examination all right not only that there is a name of the officer called as the patan pale patan pale is basically again the sanskritized name so whenever we come across any trade or any administrative name we get to see the sanskritized version patan pale means the in charge of the patan means the port in charge of the port patan pal okay then if we talk about the division of the kingdom 
इट वॉज डिवाइडेड इन टू द फोर पार्ट मंडलम और द नाडु विच वर प्रोविंसेस उर वॉज द टाउन पेरूर वॉज द बिग विलेज एंड सितरूर वॉज द स्मॉल विलेज प्रैक्टिकली वी हैड ओनली टू दैट इज द नाडूज एंड उर नाडूज एंड उर दीज यूज टू बी द वेरी वेरी सिंपल डिविजन ऑफ द एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव रीजन बट एज वी विल मूव फर्दर एंड वी विल रीच टू द सातवाहनाज वी विल रीच टू द पल्लवाज देन वी विल स्टार्ट हैविंग द डिटेल्ड एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव कैटेगराइजेशन ऑफ दीज एरियाज ऑल राइट एवरी वन सिमिलरली इफ वी टॉक अबाउट द सोसाइटी वी हैड द डिफरेंट सोशल क्लासेस एज पर द डिस्क्रिप्शन एज पर द डिस्क्रिप्शन ऑफ द संगम एज एपिक्स संगम एज एपिक्स वेर एज द ओल्डेस्ट संगम लिटरेचर वर्क कॉल्ड एज तोलकापियम दैट टॉक्स अबाउट द डिफरेंट कम्युनिटीज टॉक्स अबाउट द डिफरेंट कम्युनिटीज हियर यू विल सी द रूलिंग क्लास कॉल्ड अरसार ब्राह्मणास कॉल्ड अंतनार पीपल इन्वॉल्व इन द ट्रेड एंड कॉमर्स कॉल्ड एज द वनिगा वनिगार अगेन रिलेटेड टू द संस्कृत वर्ड वनिक वनिक इन संस्कृत मीन्स द वैश्य और द ट्रेडर हियर इन तमिल द वनिगार is related to the vaishya of the sanskrit or the vanik of the sanskrit okay the vellalars were simply the laborers the vellalars were the laborers but as the time passes this is around the 3rd 2nd century bc but this is around the 4th 5th century ad okay then we have a new class called as anadi the captains of army the vellalas who were the laborers here they became the rich peasants and the arasars arasars were the ruling class earlier as well as later as well as later but in the earlier part we have so many tribes so many tribes mentioned but when we come to the later time period we have the lowest class in the society called as the Cadaisiers, called as the Cadaisiers, Cadaisiers and the Periars, Cadaisiers and the Periars. These two became the lowest class who were subjected to the manual work, laborer work, and often, very often, they were discarded from the rest of the social groups in the society. So, can we say that? Can we say that the Sangam? or the you know epic age in tamil literature or tamil culture that reached to the similar point in the cultural evolution where the northern india was after the decline of the kushana period and during the arise during the rise of the gupta period okay everyone because this becomes even more clear when we talk about the position of the women when we talk about the position of the women here even though the women poets were very common in the sangam period this question is also asked in the upsc prelims examination women poets were common during the sangam period however however despite the love marriages were common and the women they were appreciated for their bravery it was expected from a woman to live a chaste life live a chaste life sacred life called as karpu called as karpu okay so the character was considered as the biggest achievement for a woman remember that and when you when you start associating the identity of the woman only with the character not with anything else then this shows the regressive status of the society because if the character is important for the man only then we can say that character is equal, equally important for both men and women but when it is important only for a woman then it simply shows the dominance of the man who don't give any significance any importance to the character of the man but only consider the character of the woman as a virtue as a virtue okay so overall we can say that the condition of women in the sangam period was not very high not very great but it was not very bad either for example 
सती सिस्टम वॉज प्रैक्टिस बट ओनली इन द हायर स्टेट ऑफ द सोसाइटी एंड इवन द डांसर्स वर गेटिंग द पैटर्नेज ऑफ द किंग्स और द नोबल्स विच इंडिकेटेड दैट प्रोबेबली द वुमेन फ्रॉम द लोअर स्टेट ऑफ द सोसाइटी वेयर इन अ बेटर पोजिशन एज कंपेयर टू द वुमेन ऑफ द रॉयल फैमिलीज एंड सोसाइटीज ऑल राइट टॉकिंग अबाउट द फाइन आर्ट्स इन द संगम पीरियड so poetry music and dancing were popular we all are aware in fact one of the earliest works called as a natya shastra called as natya shastra written by bharat muni written by bharat muni or simply known as bharatyar this has to be considered as one of the earliest works on the dance and other theatrics in our culture not only that the donations were given to the poets as well as the royal courts were also crowded with the singing that singers and musicians singers and musicians called as the panar and viralayar panar and viralayar remember the terms very very crucial terms okay now apart from that apart from that if we talk about the musical instruments the drums etc and the yars etc they were used in the court in the court performance dancers were definitely patronized by the kings and eventually the same practice of uh, patronized dancers that would be recommended in the temples as well as the time will pass on and as the source of revenue will become decentralized then the revenues will be collected and accumulated in the temple areas so the area or the point of uh, you know such cultural performances that will shift from the royal court towards the temple towards the temple premises okay we will understand this statement in our subsequent classes where we will try to connect the dots of the growth of decentralization growth of the feudal culture with the emergence of emergence of the local cultural traditions dances music and so many other practices all right everyone now the last point is about the foreign trade as we have already discussed that trade was their most important source of uh, earning and not only that they had numerous seaports and had extensive trading relations with the great roman empire for example if we talk about the port cities not only not only the puhar was important but tondai mujris korkai arikmedu and marakkanam all these were important port cities during the sangam period not only that we have the evidences of the gold and silver coins with the images of roman emperor august okay roman emperor augustus tiberius nero all these people they are portrayed on the coins which are collected obtained from the from the sangam age kingdoms right everyone so this indicates that the export of the sangam kingdoms which consisted of the fabrics spices you know cardamom pepper ginger sandalwood so many things ivory fragrances so many luxurious things that definitely provided them huge trade margins and huge profits from the roman rulers in fact this trade relation is also described in one of the finest earlier books related to the trade relations between asia and europe the book is called as the periplus of the erythrean sea which also provides the map which is considered as one of the earliest maps in the human kind and not only that if you look at this particular map you will also have the idea of so many port cities right nelsinda mujris tende right naura guys even in uh, probably 2019 or 2020 there was a question asked by upsc about the port cities such as uh, chaul okay such as uh, you know dabhol right and soptam and sopatma right so we can have the questions from such type of uh, images such type of places 
okay everyone so i hope that all of you got a wide and comprehensive covering of uh, the sangam period and you got a clear idea to understand about the society and culture of the sangam age kingdoms so in tomorrow's lecture we will be doing the satavahana age we will be trying to understand about the satavahana kingdom also we will try to understand that how did the emergence of feudal system start in the satavahana age till then thank you so much for watching it guys and in case if you are preparing for 2024 examination please uh, have a look on this uh, wonderful offer that we are having for you here we are offering the great courses of uh, p2i that is from prelims to interview at a very substantial very uh, very marginalized cost of rupees 29999 given that you are using this code asr live and when you use this code this is going to give you the best price and the benefit is also very great because here the comprehensive 15 to 18 month long program is there that is giving you the wider and in depth coverage of the syllabus along with the along with the proper dedicated books for upsc handwritten notes are there current affairs program is there and if you are able to clarify you know if you are able to simply qualify the first stage then you also get an opportunity to come at this uh, you know campus of study iq to stay here to take the classes and that is called as the mains residential program after that you are also provided support for the interview guidance so almost everything that you will need to clear your examination that is provided here so that is very very important program you must check that the last day to enroll for this program is 11th of august when the batches are going to start on 11th of august 8 am so practically 10th august is last date so guys do not delay it and have a great uh, ahead have a great time ahead thank you so much for watching it let's meet tomorrow till then bye bye jai hind